Hey, what you reading for? Creating a list of must-read works of fiction for literature lovers is a nearly impossible task. There are so many authors, so many countries, so many genres, so many time periods. Virtually impossible. And yet, I have created such a list. And I think it's a pretty darn good one, actually. I have selected four works that I believe are staples of the craft of the art of literature. They are important works that have served to define and expand the craft, and they have inspired uh, countless other works and continue to inspire. For this list of must-reads, we have works of fiction from four different countries spanning over 135 years, and they are what I believe to be must-reads for lovers of fiction and for students and professionals of the craft. Thank you for clicking on this video. Please go ahead and hit the like button and subscribe. That helps other literature lovers find this channel and it motivates me to keep putting out content and I do appreciate the support. I will run a short intro sequence and I will see you on the other side for my list of must read works of fiction for lovers of literature. In chronological order, we will begin in France in 1844 with The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas, which is the longest work on this list, and it is long, um, of 1,200 pages, depending on the edition, but it is a spectacular work of fiction. It is highly engrossing and an immersive reading experience. In The Count of Monte Cristo, we have love, jealousy, the struggles of classism, the abuse of power. We have obsession and revenge and the high cost of obsession and revenge. This book is soaked in pathos and in intrigue. The reason The Count of Monte Cristo has remained such a classic for so long and uh, the reason why it has made my short list of must-read works of fiction is that it is exquisitely written and expertly crafted. Now, students and professionals of the craft, we are well aware of the adage, show, don't tell, which means that the writer is meant to show the reader what the characters are feeling, show the reader what the characters are thinking, and uh, how their decisions um, and their actions, uh, what motivates their decisions and their actions. And this book is the master class of that important aspect of effective storytelling. It takes its time, over 1,200 pages, but we are shown the impetus and the maturation of each character's thoughts, and feelings, desires, and decisions. This book is spectacular. It's a classic for a reason and a must-read for students and professionals of the craft and for lovers of literature in general. For the next entry on our list, we will cross the Atlantic and jump ahead 47 years to have a look at a short story, The Yellow Wallpaper by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. First published in 1892, The Yellow Wallpaper is an early example, the earliest actually that I can think of of um, an early example of what I call agenda-driven fiction. This is a work that is meant not necessarily to explore the human condition or to entertain like other stories have done in the past, but this is a story that is meant to per, uh, raise awareness about a social issue and to persuade the reader to change their mind and to take action. Agenda-driven fiction is extremely popular today, especially in genre work. Uh, and writers and publishers of this type of fiction, they should take a note of this American classic because it is far more effective than anything that is being put out today. Despite the fact that it did lay out a pretty effective blueprint for us to use now, when I call 
the yellow wallpaper agenda-driven fiction. I do not mean that pejoratively. In fact, when you read the story, you, like me, you're probably not even aware that there is an agenda behind the story. I'm only aware of the, or I only became aware of the agenda when I read other works from Charlotte Perkins Gilman. Because uh, Charlotte Perkins Gilman was a, a strong, outspoken feminist. And I mean that in the most positive sense of the term. Because that term is thrown around in some circles as a pejorative, and that is not how I'm using it here. I mean, she is someone who advocated and uh, worked for the uh, fair and equal treatment of women. In much of her writing, she wears her agenda on her sleeve. That is not the case for the yellow wallpaper, which is what in part makes it so effective. It is effective in its subtlety. She does not point her finger or preach in this work. Instead, what she does is she gives us, the reader, hints and suggestions of what the, her protagonist is experiencing. And we, as the reader, are given the protagonist's perspective. And with the beautiful writing and the, in the subtlety, um, we are compelled to feel the fear and the confusion that this uh, character is experiencing. It's very effective. Additionally, what this story does right is that it gives us the perspective of, the, of this main character who is a woman suffering from some form of depression, perhaps postpartum depression. And we are shown through, uh, through her perspective how her feelings, her, um, her health, her mental health is not taken seriously um, by her husband. And a case could be made that her husband is the villain in the story. However, he is presented as a human being and not as a monster. So this adds another level of realism to the story and it just compels the reader into, uh, into a state of empathy for the character. And in consequence to all women in society whose mental health and whose feelings and whose, whose being really is not valued as much as it should be. This short story has been incredibly influential, especially, especially in the horror community. And I don't think it was initially intended to be a work of horror. It was initially published in the New England magazine which was a literary review, not a genre review. But the yellow wallpaper has gone on to be a major influence on horror writing, if not a blueprint on how to write effective horror, a, a, a pillar of the genre, actually. We can see strongly and clearly the influence of the yellow wallpaper in some uh, very important works that would come after, such as Shirley Jackson's The Haunting of Hill House or Stephen King's early works such as Carrie or The Shining, and even some more contemporary works such as Paul Tremblay's A Head Full of Ghosts. We see the yellow wallpaper has left its mark clearly on these works and will undoubtedly continue to do so. It is an exceptional work of fiction, and it has redefined how the reader is meant to react and interact with the writing, and it is a must-read for lovers of literature. For the next work on this list, we will jump ahead 64 years and head south to the beautiful country of Argentina and talk about the most important collection of short stories ever published. And that is, of course, Ficciones by Jorge Luis Borges. Ficciones is 13 short stories written um, in the 1940s and 1950s, early 1950s, and uh, by Argentinian writer Jorge Luis Borges, who, in addition to being a poet and a writer and a lecturer, he was also a librarian. So the 13 stories that comprise Ficciones all center around books, libraries, the reader's relationship with books, the reader's relationship with fiction, and how fiction defines and informs 
the reader's relationship with reality. And it's an amazing, seminal work. There is one story in particular that has uh, made a permanent camp in my mind. And this is a story, uh, it's quite a famous one, uh, where the protagonist checks an encyclopedia for some information and he finds an entry about a country that he has never heard of, a country with their culture and their beliefs and their philosophy. And he becomes fascinated with that. So he decides to uh, do some digging and find out more about this country, except he's having a hard time finding other, other material on this country. In fact, he finds a reprint of that in that encyclopedia and the entry for that country is not in the reprint. So that sends him down many a rabbit hole to find out more about this country and, or how that entry found its way into that one specific volume of one edition of an encyclopedia. That's one story among many where a work of fiction opens up a new aspect of reality to the reader and the reader then explores that reality which then leads to other rabbit holes and labyrinths. Ficcionis is an amazing book and an amazing collection. It was incredibly influential to the magical realism movement that swept uh, South America. It has been incredibly influential to works of fantasy and philosophical fiction. House of Leaves, which I think is a masterpiece, um, clearly largely inspired or even a homage to Ficcionis. I think that anyone who has a love of books, a love of fiction, they need to check out this seminal work and they will be very glad they did so. Now for my last entry on this list, something quite a bit lighter. We will again cross the Atlantic and we will jump ahead 28 years and stop in the country of Italy to talk about if on a Winter's Night, A Traveler by Italo Calvino. A short novel, about 250 pages or so. Uh, it is a novel that is very difficult to explain, but I will try. A reader begins reading a book. He's really into it, uh, but then he finds that his copy is corrupted. It's just the opening section repeated over and over again. So he returns to the book uh, store to get another copy, the one hopefully that is not corrupted. And at the bookstore, he meets a woman who is there for the exact same reason. And they find out that the book that they had started to enjoy um, is actually a different book by a different author. So they get a copy of that book and only to discover later that the copies they have are corrupted too. The book, If on a Winter's Night, a Traveler, is about a book, If on a Winter's Night, a Traveler, a book that sends the reader on a quest to read it. It's a book about books, a book about the reader's relationship with fiction. It's about love, about time, about so much more. It's funny, it's thought provoking, it's touching. It's a celebration of the reading experience, a celebration of the reading journey. It's a must read for book lovers. So there you have it, my short selection of must-reads for lovers of literature. What do you think of my list? It's, it's pretty good, right? Isn't it? Do you have any experience with the books I talked about in this video? What is your opinion of them? Uh, do you ha can you think of other books that you wish I had included in this uh, short selection? That is what the comment section is for. I always love um, hearing your feedback. I love connecting with you in the comment section. I am also a writer. I have books out. I would encourage you to check them out. Uh, you can find uh, links in the description box below. Uh, don't forget to hit like and subscribe. Thank you for watching. I will see you at the next video.